All right, it's uh, nine o'clock right now, so let's start our seminar today. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lucy Ko, one of the co-hosts uh, of the Bureau Seminar Series. Uh, it's my greatest honor and pleasure to uh, have uh, Dr. Sharon Moser here as our speaker. Uh, many of you might not know, today was originally uh, scheduled for the three symp symposiums, so we didn't uh, asked Sharon until probably uh, three, week, three, four weeks ago. So we appreciate uh, Sharon is willing to uh, spend her time with us uh, for one hour in this morning. So I'm gonna give you a brief introduction of Dr. Sharon Moser. Uh, she is a William Stamp Ferris Chair and Professor at the University of Texas at Austin. She was Dean of the Jackson School of Geosciences from 2009 to 2020 and department chair from 2007 to 2009. Uh, Dr. Sharon's exper expertise is structure geology, structure petrology and tectonics. She joined the school as a faculty in 1978 and has supervised over 50 graduate students and was also a field camp director for 15 years. Uh, she has spearheaded two National Science Foundation sponsored initiative. Uh, the future of undergrad geoscience education start 2014 and uh, the future of graduate preparation for the workforce starting uh, 2017. Uh, Dr. Sharon Moser was also president of AGI American Geoscience Institute from 2000. Uh, uh, 2012 to 2013, and president of the Geological Society of America, GSA, from 2000 to 2001. And she was also a chair of Council of Scientific Society president in 2004. She's a founder and past chair of the Board for Geoscience World, which is the International Journal Aggregation for Geoscientists. Uh, this year, she was awarded uh, Marcus Milling Legendary Geoscientist Medalist uh, by the AGI, American Geoscience Institute. Uh, she was also awarded the College of Liberal Arts and Science Alum Achievement Award from University of Illinois at uh, Champaign-Urbana uh, in 2016. She's a fellow of the GSA and receiving the Distinguished Service Award in 2003. Uh, and she's also a recipient of the um, Association of Women Geoscientist Outstanding Education Award, uh, also a member of AGU and AAPG. So with that, uh, it's really our greatest honor to have her here talking about uh, undergrad and graduate education and how we prepare for the workforce. So Sharon, I'll turn it to you. Uh, well, thank you, Lucy, for uh, that lovely introduction. And um, it's really good to see all of you again and to be here today. I wish it was in person, uh, but it's great to see all of your faces. So with that, I will share my screen. So as Lucy said, uh, my uh, topic today is preparing uh, the geoscientist workforce for the future with a focus on undergraduate and graduate uh, geoscience education. And I should note that this is uh, very similar to a talk I gave at AAPG uh, about a month ago. And so over the last six years, the geoscience community has developed a consensus on this concept skills and competencies that are needed by undergraduates and similar skills and competencies that are needed for earth, ocean and atmospheric science graduate students, but at a more advanced level. And most of the talk, uh, we'll be focusing on these two uh, aspects, but I will end by talking about what department heads and chairs from across the country are doing to implement these changes to their programs and to meet these needs. But first, I want to say a little bit about geoscience employment. Uh, AGI has predicted that by 2028, we will have a shortage of 35,000 uh, full-time equivalent uh, geoscientists uh, and the employment for geoscientists is expanding. Uh, in this past September of 2020, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, 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 projected that geoscience uh, occupations would increase over the next decade between four and 8% 
uh, with the exception of uh, geoscience faculty, which would be two to 4%. But I think it's really important to realize that the careers of today are not those of the next decade. And in fact, the same is true is the careers of today are not the same as they were a decade ago either. In September, APG Explorer had an article uh, talking about the evolving industry changes and how that had an impact on the workforce. And Chris Keene, who's director of the Workforce Group for American Geoscience Institute, or AGI, uh, talked about how they, were, they had discovered a significant disparity between what new graduate geoscience students uh, knew and what they were uh, prepared for in the workplace and said that changes were needed in university departments for students and alluded to studies that are being done to determine what the future geoscience should look like. Uh, he's obviously involved in this and this is uh, the topic that I'll be talking about today um, as I've been spearheading this initiative. So for starting with undergraduate geoscience education, uh, in order to get the community involved, we first had a summit in 2014 with about 200 educators that span the range from major research universities all the way down to community colleges and some employers. And over a three day period, we had surprising collective agreement. Uh, we then did a community survey with 85% of them had not attended the summit and there's about 500 uh, respondents with most being academics, but it's again, more employers. And then in 2015, we had a geoscience employers workshop with 46 participants and they spanned the range of uh, geoscience employment, but dominantly for geologists and geophysicists. There were a few in ocean and atmosphere, but very few. Uh, they agreed overall with the outcomes of this uh, summit and the survey results, but they added significant granularity to uh, the ideas that were expressed in broad form by the uh, previous events. And then in 2016, we held a summit for heads and chairs and had over a hundred department heads and chairs who focused on how to implement uh, these changes and each developed an individual action plan. And this fall, we're uh, publishing a vision and change document and the vision and change document will be out hopefully this fall, <laughs> and it contains a tremendous amount more than what I'm gonna to cover today. Uh, but it's an extensive document. Uh, it contains the results of the six year NSF sponsored initiative, and it provides a robust academic and employer community vision for the future of undergraduate education. It does talk some about graduate education as well, but it's more than just concepts and skills. Uh, and competencies. It talks about recruiting, retaining, best ways of teaching, uh, preparing students for the future, and many other uh, aspects. And it also gives key strategies and recommendations for transformative change and provides a lot of case studies from uh, heads and chairs that have gone out and tried to implement these things. And it represents the input of over a thousand geoscientists. One of the uh, really game-changing things that happened at the first summit uh, for undergraduates was recognizing that competencies, skills, and conceptual understanding is more important than taking specific courses. We asked in our survey whether people agreed with this, and the graph in the center shows that for academics employers, with blue being yes, uh, they overwhelmingly agreed that this was true. And this is really critical because if you get a bunch of uh, geologists or geophysicists of any flavor together and say, what courses should people take? They don't agree. But if you ask them what the students need to know and be able to do, they do agree. And that really makes a difference in moving forward. So it's understanding geoscience concept and processes, not memorizing or learning a lot of information that you can look up, but truly understanding the concepts and processes is what uh, the group felt was important. And of course, developing scientific, technical and professional skills. But most important is building competency, the ability to successfully accomplish something using that knowledge and that skills. 
this uh, summit, the first summit, identified some very broad areas that they thought all undergraduates needed to understand. Uh, Earth is a complex dynamic system with linkages between the different parts, deep time, climate change, natural resources, surface processes, earth materials or structure, natural hazards and hydrogeology. And in the survey, we again asked whether people agreed and how strongly they agreed or disagreed with this. And in this and then following graphs, blue is very important and red is important. And as you can see, uh, the survey responses, uh, the vast majority thought they were important or very important. We also asked people to list other things and there was no consensus on anything else. If you divide this by employers versus uh, academics, you find that they agree almost completely. And in the employer uh, workshop, they took those broad concepts and they really drilled down as to what do these things mean? And I think it's important to recognize that these are concepts, not courses. So, and they were very broad. So like earth is a complex system that included to them things like energy, mass, fluid transport, uh, looking at how work or changes that affect earth systems and looking at system parts for deep time. It wasn't just the conventional things we generally teach our students, but also the impact of time on processes and events and rate and temporal reasoning. For earth materials, it included things like looking at resource applications uh, and really understanding processes that form rocks and minerals. And earth structure wasn't just plate tectonics and the internal structure of the earth, but it was also understanding deformation processes and structural controls on research accumulations. And the same with the others, surface processes, what you would expect, but also habitability and sustaining life, hydrogeology, again, what you would expect, but including economics and public policy, natural resources, really understanding what is a natural resource, uh, understanding where those resources are, where they come from, what's renewable, what's not, and the resource dependency and the limits. And for climate change, uh, climate change on a geologic scale and the present scale, and really understanding driving forces, causal mechanisms, and impacts of climate change. The summit also looked at skills that students needed, and they recognized that there are skills that all scientists need, and then there's skills that are really specific to geoscience, and so they divided them together. And the science skills obviously are critical thinking and problem solving skills, being able to communicate effectively to scientists and non-scientists, accessing and integrating information from different sources and continuing to learn, of course, understanding and using scientific methods, strong quantitative skills and ability to apply and working in interdisciplinary teams and across cultures. And again, with blue being very important and red being important, uh, the uh, survey respondents agreed. And once again, if you look at uh, what employers say versus what um, academics say, they, they agreed. For geoscience skills, they were making inferences about Earth system from observations in the natural world combined with experimentation modeling, which is of course what we do. Uh, readily solving problems, particularly those in 3 and 4D, working with uncertainty, non-uniqueness, ambiguity, integrating data from different disciplines and apply systems thinking, strong field skills, working knowledge of GIS, strong computational skills, ability to manage and analyze large data sets, and being technologically versatile. And although the, uh, the participants uh, had different uh, amounts of agreement. Overall, still the majority agreed that all of these uh, were important. So at the employer's workshop, uh, just as for concepts, they did look at uh, the what these skills actually were and in a lot more uh, granularity, particularly in terms of what it meant in terms of the workforce. And I will address these uh, but I'm going to do it at the same time I look at uh, graduate skills and 
uh, show how there's a change in what undergraduates need and the depth at which uh, graduate students need these skills. But there is one that didn't show up for graduate students that I want to uh, mention first. And that is the importance of field experiences. Field camps, field experiences of any type, uh, the employers at the undergraduate uh, employees workshop felt very strongly that it was critically important. It was unique, it was essential, it was something you really couldn't repli uh, replicate or substitute. And that it really improved spatial cognition, uh, creative problem solving, teamwork, and geoscience synthesis. So what about graduate students? Well, most PhD and master's students in STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering, and math, uh, don't go into academia when they finish. Uh, for STEM in general, uh, the PhD students, it's about 50% in business and 50% academia. If you look at the geosciences, it's about 51% of the PhDs and only about 4% of the masters uh, go into academia. And when you really look at it, graduate programs are too narrowly focused on academic research. There are many skills that students need to develop that are valued by both academic and non-academic employers. And that recognition is what led NSF to have us uh, do another initiative on universal skills for geoscience graduate students and their success in the workforce. But in this case, they wanted us to look at earth, atmosphere, and ocean scientists, and all three of them together. For this initiative, we started with a geoscience employees workshop. We had 52 participants. Uh, they spanned earth, atmosphere, and ocean scientists. It was a really interesting mix of people. And uh, it was people in industry, people in business, and also um, people in major research labs and government labs and government agencies like NOAA and NASA and so on. And they took the undergraduate results and built, built on them and defined what skills and competencies were needed for PhDs and master's graduate students. And then in 2019, we had a, a summit for department heads and chairs with about 74 participants. And they, like the previous group focused on how to implement these plans and implement these changes and develop the individual action plans. So for PhD and master's students, because it was earth, ocean and atmospheric sciences, they focused only on skills and competencies and did not focus on concepts. But across the board, they agreed that students needed to have expertise and depth in their core area and a good education in the geosciences that basically covered the breadth of the core area and had a good grounding in all of uh, the sciences. And that they needed core technical skills and relevant areas of expertise and a deep understanding of fundamentals of mechanics of the techniques and methods that they were using. And it was very gratifying that they across the board thought that graduates with masters and PhDs were generally coming out with very strong knowledge and technical skills in the areas in which they had done research. And that's one of the reasons field skills didn't come up because in some of those, uh, and particularly atmospheric sciences, they don't do field work, uh, but where uh, field skills were, um, appropriate, they also felt that those were good. And I, since I'm talking to uh, the Jackson School, uh, I was really pleased some of the employers actually stood up in front of the whole group and said that the Jackson School students were coming out with uh, strong knowledge and technical skills. So that was very gratifying. However, that's the good news. Uh, many of these skills that were not directly related with the research that the students were doing were felt to be lacking pretty much across the board uh, for uh, students uh, coming out. And the employers really focused on those and really, again, built on those that were needed for undergraduates. 
And so what I'm gonna do next is discuss the granularity employers provided for undergraduates for skills and competencies and look at how the students should progress through their master's and PhD degrees and what additional skills are actually needed. So for both undergrad and master's and PhD students, employers stressed what academics call or science habits of mind. Geoscientific and systems thinking, understanding how systems work and how different parts of the system interact and how they behave independently and how they interact and behave when they're coupled. Uh, Earth is a complex nonlinear coupled system of interacting parts and processes and temporal uh, spatial thinking, both in three and 4D. Understanding processes, linkages, feedbacks, driving forces and impacts, and being able to do geologic reasoning and synthesis. The main difference between the undergraduate and grads uh, had to do with system thinking. Uh, employers really at the graduate level were interested in system thinking in all senses of it, all types of systems, whereas that the undergrads they were mainly focused on earth as uh, the complex system. For undergrads, critical thinking and problem solving was viewed as preparation for the real world professional projects or for future research in graduate school. And it was um, really interested, they were really interested in problem solving with real data, non-unique answers. They wanted students to be able to do the whole thing, understand the context of the problem, identify what questions they should ask, what data they should collect, what methods they should use, and then be able to do it. Collect the data, analyze the quality, interpret and apply, and make predictions with limited data. And the types of problems they wanted were ones in open and dynamic systems, no clear answers, high ambiguity, where they had to work by analogy, uh, inference and limits of certainty. Basically, the kinds of things that you can't look up the answer in the back of the book and that there really is no uh, complete answer. And they wanted them to visualize and solve problems both in 3D and with time, 4D, understand and manage certainties, really understand the importance of scale, both in space and time, and critically evaluate the literature. For graduate students, uh, critical thinking and problem solving was thought to be the, the most important skill, regardless of which of the three branches of the geosciences uh, you were working in. And the real focus was on independent critical thinking, problem development, execution, and analysis of skills. And critical thinking was supposed to be pragmatic and logical and flexible and open-minded. And they were supposed to have a good grasp of uncertainty. And they really focused on the need to be able to define a problem and apply an appropriate solution. And really understanding the difference between a sufficient solution and a precise complete solution. Uh, students and many academics have a tendency to work towards that precise complete solution when uh, in the workforce, most of the time it's a sufficient solution is what is necessary. And also to focus on translating the problem to, so what? Uh, can you articulate the importance of the outcomes? Do you know what decisions are going to be made based on your results? And of course, to understand the broader impacts of your research and how to communicate those impacts. And it was very unsettling to hear that most of the employers felt that many graduate students struggle with being able to define a problem and in identifying how to apply that solution, but they could solve the problem if it was given to them. Uh, in terms of communication for both undergraduates and masters and PhDs, uh, they needed to be able to express technical work effectively to appropriate audiences. That's both in writing and verbal communication and not just within their specialty and other sciences and engineering fields, but also to non-technical audiences and management, public, the press, and to be able to convey complex material in a simple way, uh, particularly that was stressed with PhD students and master's students, uh, more so than with undergraduates, and to express ideas logically, 
being comfortable speaking with people whose English is not their first language, and being able to communicate societal and or financial impacts. For graduate students, they also want them to have skill in editing, be able to evaluate things critically, recognize credible sources, and accept criticism. And for both undergraduates and graduate students, they really were interested in listening skills. For them to pay attention to what others say, to answer the questions that they actually ask and do so logically, and be highly sensitive to the audience, basically be able to read the room. In terms of quantitative skills for undergraduates, uh, it was pointed out repeatedly that it actually increases your employability and resiliency and uh, ability to stay in the workforce during downturns. And undergraduates needed to have higher level math and computer programming skills. That includes probability, statistics, uncertainty analysis, and risk assessment, calculus, differential equations, and or linear algebra, which they felt was more important depended on the actual employer and uh, computer programming and modeling. For graduate students, it wasn't just having computational skills, but also embracing technology as creators and engaging in a genuine innovation. Uh, they thought graduate students needed basic programming skills, particularly in scripted languages, uh, be able to code and translate to newer codes and more effective systems, have geospatial skills and geospatial reasoning, be able to analyze algorithms, uh, be familiar with machine learning and uh, AI, uh, transition from super computing to cloud computing, and in modeling, be able to actually develop models and analyze and evaluate them. And they very definitely felt that the basics of statistics and higher level math is something that they should have as an undergraduate if they're going to go on to graduate school. And if they don't have it, they would need to get it right away. Uh, data analysis, undergraduates, uh, and this is coming from the uh, employer's workshop in 2015, uh, needed to be able to uh, handle and analyze large data sets, different types, different disciplines, uh, integrate multiple data sets, model, do statistical analysis, and use you know, visual models and modeling tools and simulations. And overall, be able to integrate their technical quantitative skills, programming, and application development. For graduate students, uh, data management, and data analytics was uh, felt to be currently needed and across the entire spectrum was going to be something that was going to grow in importance over the future. And this is something if you compare, this is 2018 for graduate students, but if you look at what they said, they very definitely had increased the amount of data analytics they thought undergraduates needed and the importance of it to graduate students. And they felt that all graduate students coming out should have awareness of data analytics, its applications and processes for using data, be able to handle large data sets and examine data sets to draw conclusions about the information contained. And most graduate students and certainly in the future, probably all of them needed to know a lot more they needed to understand data acquisition and collection, be able to effectively organize, manage, and synthesize uh, data, so data management and analysis, and then be able to do data manipulation, data integration, data simulation, data, look at data quality and work with different qualities of data, do visualization and modeling, uh, understand valuation of data, and a lot of other data science. And all of this they felt was going to increase in the future. They also, uh, for both undergraduates and graduate students, talked about teamwork and the importance of teamwork, particularly in uh, working across disciplines and the importance of being able to work in a team with different backgrounds, specialties and experiences and different personalities. Uh, and for uh, graduate students in particular, being able to work with other scientists and trained individuals towards a goal and having the ability to get others to work together and for everybody valuing the diversity of thought. In terms of project management, being able to manage conflict, 
uh, being a leader and a follower, listening, sharing, being coachable, taking directions, but also leading. And goal setting, solution oriented approaches, time management. And for graduate students, they stress the need to be able to evaluate expertise, that you need to develop self awareness and know your own strengths and recognize the skills among yourself and others. There were additional professional skills for undergraduates. It was mainly professionalism, which included business acumen, risk management, exposure to business basics and operations. For PhDs and masters, there was more in terms of project and program management and business skills. Everything from understanding budgets and financials to managing people, making economic data-driven decisions, managing time and resources, uh, being able to distill everything down to make it relevant to a CEO, innovation and entrepreneurship and time value concepts. Uh, for both levels, social dynamics and people skills, uh, the ability to work with people with different personalities, emotional makeup, viewpoints, specialties, abilities, educational backgrounds, cultures, languages, and to be aware of implicit biases. They also felt students needed a global perspective. Uh, they needed to understand the global impact of what they do and be able to work with different cultures and understand the social connection. Uh, what is the relevance and implications of their work and why? What is the purpose of their research or work? They also stressed leadership in science, education, public policy, po politics, business, and basically effectively being able to guide others to accomplish goals or objectives in a cohesive and coherent manner. And ethics and professionalism, codes of conduct, awareness of risk and impact, integrity, and it's important to science and scientific process. So what are some of the traits for success for both undergraduates and graduate students? being intellectually flexible, being able to apply skills in new scenarios, uh, having an adaptable and diverse skill set. It didn't necessarily make as much difference what the skill set was rather than your evolution potential. Uh, willingness to be a lifelong learner. It was important to learn how to learn. You need to be able to learn and apply new concepts, ideas and data and new technology and software. And it was really important to have an internal drive to do well, to be able to overcome risk aversion, uh, to adopting new technologies or ideas, and to overcome the fear of failure. So here's an overall list of the skills that for both undergraduates and graduate students, employers felt that they needed. And basically, undergraduates ought to start developing these, should become proficient at these as they approach graduate school and do masters, they should uh, start to master these. And most of these skills, by the time they finished a PhD, they felt that they should be uh, experts in. And I put over here, uh, if you go to our, the Jackson School website and you go to events, you can link to uh, a lot of information uh, that has been uh, gathered on this these subjects. So how are undergrad, how are heads and chairs and departments are trying to uh, implement these things? Uh, well, for undergraduates, there's two main ways that are really effective in terms of um, developing these skills and competencies and also the concepts. Uh, constant engagement, experiential learning, and constant engagement or opportunities to practice the skills and use the concepts. And that's problem solving using real data in classes, uh, written and oral presentation, intensive courses, collaborative, integrative, interdisciplinary team projects and integration and interactive use of technology. And there's a lot of pedagogies out there that really help uh, support the development of these skills and competencies. The other is substantial experiences, experience with authentic research or collection of information that can be as field work or field experiences, uh, other kinds of capstone courses or project oriented courses similar to engineering design courses, independent research experiences or projects, senior theses, internships, uh, REUs, research uh, experiences for undergraduates. 
and active collaboration between academia and employers. For graduate students, uh, the heads and chairs felt that most of the skills and could be developed into competencies while the students actually did their research. But there were also some and specific ways within courses that they could learn those. And some of these things would be across the, like ethical behavior would be across the entire uh, graduate uh, program. But they also talked a lot about co-curricular activities, short courses, online certificate programs, uh, giving presentations at meetings, and being active in departmental activities, outreach programs, internships, professional organizations, so on. But one of the things that they really stressed was that departments and students really need to take ownership of making sure that students have the skills that they need and competencies to be able to be uh, successful in the workplace. And that basically preparing students for future success, you needed to advise students on skills and knowledge needed for a wide variety of careers. You needed to provide them with opportunities for development of these competencies, and you need to mentor students throughout the program. And there was a real push, and there still is a real push, for students developing individual development plans. Those are customized roadmaps for professional training and goals. And it starts with self-assessment, where you look at what you're good at and what you're interested in. Uh, then you look at careers and find out about careers and see what kinds of things you're interested potentially in doing and what skills you would need. Then you set your goals for how it is that you will build your network and get the experience you need. And you will work with a mentor in terms of implementing these. And then of course you have to self-assess again and do the process over again, because as you go through a degree, uh, your interests change, your, uh, the workforce changes, and there's a lot of different things that can make a difference. Uh, many people that you talk to that are professional geologists changed their mind when they were in graduate school as to where they wanted to go. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sharon. That was outstanding and very great. Uh, Peter, I could go have a question on the in the chat. Um, Peter, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, good morning, Sharon. Thank you for a great summary. Um, I have two comments, more comments than questions, perhaps. The first one is an observation is that um, this is all survey based. And um, as we know, majority opinion does not necessarily come to the right conclusions. Um, so, um, is there any um, analysis, uh, for instance, looking at uh, hiring patterns and maybe even long-term success in careers where, where a team of experts compares those survey results with actually what happens in the workforce? Uh, for instance, um, I see that um, people with engineering training taking more and more positions that traditionally were covered by um, students with a geology or geoscience training. Um, so I wonder if the survey truly reflects what's actually going on in the workforce and employment. Uh, that's the first one. The second Can one- Can I answer that one first, Peter? Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. okay. I might forget that. <laughs> uh, actually, most of it isn't survey. Uh, only, you know, probably half of the input we got uh, was from surveys. Most of it was from working directly with employers and getting their input in terms of, you know, what, and it was more than just the, uh, I mean, we had two employers workshop, but we also had a lot of back and forth with employers um, uh, and actually quite a few other workshops as well. Uh, and this is what the recruiters that are hiring students in these different fields say. And these are, this is what people who you know, are in high level positions in these industries say. And one of the things that we really focused on, particularly with the graduate students was not just what they see students coming in need now, but what they saw over the next 10 years and how they saw things changing. But so it's, you know, uh, and, they would tell you <laughs> that just because somebody in their 
40s, 50s, or 60s has skills that are very, very valuable and made them where they were, that those skills are not going to be enough today and but in the future. My question would be, is there a follow-up to, um, that would be the perception of the recruiters or even management, but it may or may not actually truly reflect itself. Um, but the long-term employment um, facts are, um, they, may say, they may more be reflective of current needs, for instance, than um, what their, high, what their uh, retention um, policies are five years down the line. So I'm not sure if I would trust blindly what the recruiters are saying either or the management. Um, right, so but I will say, I mean, one of the things if you, uh, we were able to really break out what they were saying now versus what they could see for the future. So um, you can take it for what it is. Yeah, my second point is uh, there's a lot of emphasis on soft skills, which is mm -hmm. great. And I totally agree with this, but I would say, and, and in the, one of the early slides kind of the emphasizes fact-based knowledge transfer. Um, which has been traditionally the focus of undergraduate education, right? Which, which, which right. Really facts. And I would say that's all good and fine, but science is empirical and it's the empiricism of, of the predecessor, right? Of what generations have done before you. And um, if we de-emphasize facts too much, um, science will come to a grinding halt. And we see this, I review a lot of papers and I see a lot of work being done that was done 20 years ago, just people don't read what was published before. So um, facts do matter. Um, and if you go too far with the soft skills, I'm concerned that um, students don't read as much as senior scientists and, and faculty don't read. So there is a place where coursework comes in and the professor synthesizes what's known in a certain field and conveys this to the students directly. So that's a concern about voice mm -hmm. here. And I think um, people take it for granted that, that we have um, a solid foundation in the scientific facts, um, but we shouldn't. Uh, so we have I guess my, started, right? yeah, my response to that is uh, for the undergraduates, there was a very strong emphasis on understanding concepts, uh, not just memorizing things, being able to use that information and do it. And the uh, focus more on soft skills, to be honest, is because it's, that's what the students aren't getting. They are getting the other. They're not getting these things and they're not getting a chance to actually use this information and do things with it. And you understand, you know, you, you know yourself, if you actually use concepts or you use knowledge or you use skills, uh, you understand it better. Right, I'm just saying okay. we don't want to overshoot the target. That's right. I think, my point. <laughs> All right, thank you, Peter, for your question and discussion with Sharon. Uh, Richard Chukla have a comment. Richard, could you please unmute yourself and just ask Sharon? Uh, yeah. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah, Sharon, first of all, thank you. I mean, I, I, I hate this for this to sound like a, a shameless ad, ad for the EER program. <laughs> this, is, this is really a lot of what you're discussing is exactly, are exactly the premises around which the program is based. I, I'd like to add kind of a one little interesting aside with regards to, let's call it data analytics. What has really blown my mind, this is a, I, I will credit Suzanne Pierce for kind of opening my eyes to this in, in a discussion is, it's the whole scientific method that is being turned upside down by data analytics. So the, old, the method of scientific discovery and formulating a hypothesis 20 years ago might have been pretty easy or easier because reading the prevailing art on a subject was doable. I did a little personal exper experiment in looking at you know, areas of my own interest like extensional tectonics to try to understand how long it would take me to assimilate the prevailing art in extensional tectonics. So I used Google Scholar and I got 138,000 hits and I assumed I could read 10 articles a day 
it would take me 38 years to essentially assume, assimilate that sort of information. So this whole process of data-driven discovery changes or introduces another paradigm for science in general. It's not just the kind of analytics of data, it's how you develop your hypotheses and ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I will agree with you 100% about EER. <laughs> Um, in terms of what it does, there's a number of things that we do. Um, the Imperial Barrel course we used to offer is exactly the kind of thing. Uh, Peter Flemings teaches a course for undergraduates that does exactly the kinds of things that we should do. Uh, the uh, Marine Geology Geophysics field course does exactly what we're supposed to do. Our field camp does. I mean, there's a lot of things that we do and we do well, but there's a lot of things we could do better. And that's what I think we really need to concentrate on. Uh, in terms of data analytics, it is really changing things significantly. And that's one thing, it was pretty overwhelming to those of us that participated in both of the uh, employer um, workshops, the change in emphasis that occurred. And also if, you know, in the last few years, talking to people coming in, uh, from different companies and recruiting students, the emphasis they're putting and talking to alumni, the emphasis is being put on them in terms of data analytics is truly amazing. But on the other hand, I constantly heard that doesn't mean, for example, for geologists, that going in the field isn't critically important. It is critically important. You need to be able to see these uh, structures and, and sedimentary processes and things you know, in the rock record to be able to work with them and understand what you're getting. But yeah, data analytics is really, is changing things. And it's something we have to recognize that our students have to come to grips with. And to be honest, we do, across the school, we do a lot of that. Sure. All right, next question is from Rob, Rob Reed. Rob, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, I just did. Uh, hi, Sharon. A uh, quick question here. I noted some of the things that you'd you'd put down on various slides. <clears throat> Skills like be coachable, read a room, overcome fear of failure. <laughs> How do you teach that? Um, well, there's ways that you could teach people to be afraid of being failure. <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, I got that. Part, yeah. No, part of it is um, uh, having taught for many, many years, it's difficult. Uh, uh, people, students in general are afraid of failure and want some of the pedagogies people use, you know, to really get students interacting with each other in classes. Uh, so one thing that I found is, you know, this simple thing like think, peer, think pair, share. If you ask a class a question, very few people will answer. If you ask a question and say, would you talk to your neighbor and discuss this first, and then you ask them, you'll get lots and lots of hands come up because people are afraid that they're the only one who thinks this or the only one who doesn't understand. And so trying to find ways that students feel comfortable not knowing the answer or not understanding how to do something, it makes a big difference. And if, you know, uh, I don't know how to say this politely, not being arrogant and putting people down as an instructor uh, when they don't understand. You know, it's hard, you know, as a scientist, for example, if you're teaching uh, a freshman a lot of times because they just don't know. Uh, so there's, you know, those are the kinds of things. Um, and then on the other hand, it's hard. You get students in classes that are incredibly arrogant and they, know everything and you don't know anything and that's usually a sign that they're very insecure and so recognizing that and working with them uh, to accept you know that they don't necessarily know everything and they do have a lot to learn so um, those are tricky things very tricky uh, the whole culture of a lot of departments need to change I mean I've read hundreds, actually almost thousands of comments. Uh, one of the things most people don't know, the survey we did, every single question 
also had a box where they could answer. And I've read every comment and I swear almost I, all 500 people answered every single box. And um, it's amazing some of the things that, that people think out there that are uh, teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And uh, next question, Dev. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself? I know you type it out in the chat. Uh, it would be great. You can just ask Sharon. Hey, good morning, Sharon. Uh, I think we should listen to this talk every semester. It's a great way to stay uh, focused. Uh, in the COVID era, so to say, we now know there are some things that have come up like working on virtual platform, mental health, finding mentors. Uh, were these things apparent in the surveys that you did, which were before COVID? And uh, more generally would be, what do you see uh, might persist in the post COVID era that we should now think beyond what might have been there as a means of uh, cultivating that skill? going ahead? Uh, actually, um, I work closely with AGI and they've done extensive uh, surveying since COVID on the impacts of COVID. And um, it, it's interesting when you think about it, one of the things uh, that appears to be you know, in the future is much more virtual learning. Uh, so let's just take uh, field experiences. People very definitely students and faculty feel the going out in the field and actually really doing it should not go away, but that there are a lot of virtual kinds of field exercises that you can do in classes to uh, work with you know, the actual curriculum there, as well as take people out in the field or that there will be more uh, uses of virtual types. But overall, people are finding uh, in academics that uh, students really need that face-to-face. -face. They want that face-to-face. -face. They miss it. They miss interacting with uh, the faculty. They miss interacting with fellow students. Uh, they miss the one-on-one -on -one sorts of things. Um, and so assuming uh, we get to the point that it is safe for in-person classes, I think you're going to see things moving back. I mean, I don't know, uh, what was it? Five, maybe years or more ago, there was all this talk that, you know, universities were, in-person universities were uh, not the way to go, that you could learn everything online. And I think one thing COVID has shown us is people don't want that. <laughs> They want the in-person aspects of the university. And I, I actually um, could send you, I have a really pretty concise two-page write-up of the results of the uh, COVID uh, surveys, if you're interested. Yes, please. Thank you. But there is a mental health, there is a, I see your uh, chat box. There is a mental health issue uh, a lot of students are feeling very alienated and uh, just lost because they they don't have that support network. All right, thank you, Dick, for your question. Uh, Linda McCall, do you want to unmute yourself and ask Sharon? Yes. Hi, thank you so Hi. much for the talk, Sharon. That's an interesting study. I'm glad you shared that with us. Mine is just kind of a time travel question. What if you went back in time 10 years and uh, what do you think at that point they would have said the skills, knowledge, and competencies would have been? And because when you reported, what, I'm just wondering if for your results, was there anything that was unexpected or a big change from the past? I think the biggest change from the past is the data analytics. Um, most of the things that came across uh, were things, I guess, I at least already was aware of or expected mm -hmm. um, and really this I can say this to you guys were things that I really was hoping that you know over the course of being dean that we could move in these directions uh, to change things mm -hmm. uh, but um, data analytics definitely uh, that the definite emphasis on the higher level uh, math, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of really feeling that, you know, calculus wasn't enough. 
uh, that you really needed differential equations or linear algebra. Um, and really the fact that overall the employers felt statistics and probability was far more important than even calculus. Mm -hmm. And so I think those, that surprised me, that big a change. Um, and particularly the emphasis on statistics. Uh, in terms of the other skills, uh, scientists were and still are fairly siloed people, uh, don't have a tendency to necessarily talk <laughs> uh, to non-scientists as much, <laughs> and um, recognition that you have to work with others. And going back to what Peter Eichel was saying, uh, you know, engineers do have a tendency, they are, you know, there's a lot of positions that they move into that geologists don't. And part of that is because we don't have a lot of the, the math and um, data analytics sort of skills. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, part of it is we have to learn to work with engineers. We have to learn to work with people in other disciplines. And I think that might be less hard than working with people in sociology or you know, dealing with the social aspects. Thank you. And so I would say there's you know, certainly, um, if you look at Scissor or you look at, uh, oh my gosh, TextNet. I mean, those are, those are areas where you've really had to work with the community. And that's mm -hmm. not easy because you know, what people think and uh, believe have an influence on, you know, how they treat results of scientific research. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your question. Uh, okay, that's it for our, our question of today. I think I, um, I also want to ask Sharon a question. Uh, after you know, looking at all oh, your, this is probably the second time I, I look at your talk. The first time is at AAPG, and I'm still really impressed because there are just so many content or you know, action words or the traits or uh, you know, abilities that you have to learn. And I try to check boxes and try to see what I still need to learn. Um, a lot of engineering skill, like going back to math, that kind of thing. Um, I have, uh, I, I come from, uh, you know, I come from Taiwan. So at my undergrad, like all, all my professors are, they train students, they expect students to go to academia and none of them have industry background. And they have a discussion also right now, how to, how to prepare students to the workforce. Um, it, so for me, it sounds like, and I have a lot of discussion with them about, about it, I, uh, using my experiences in the U.S. Uh, it, it sounds like alumni can, can provide a, a lot of support for that, especially for alumni who, who are in the industry because it, they can help and compensate what school doesn't have because schools, a lot of them really still focus on heavily, you know, science-based uh, teaching and academia research teaching. Um, what do you think would be a, a, a good way to, to, to sort of forming that a two way, you know, students need to take initiative to learn a lot of things online ourselves, but at the same time, how, how professors can, can help. Uh, well, one, actually, I'm going to say something slightly different. I think building strong relationships with alumni and also with, um, uh, people that aren't alumni that are in industry is really important for universities and colleges to do uh, because, and that's one thing that came out from the employers is the main reason they don't do things because nobody asks mm -hmm. and that they really are interested in helping. Um, and so, I mean, for example, like our uh, friends and alumni board, the fans board, they actually do mock interviews and they, for students and they look at students' resumes and they really do try to do things to help students here. But we're pretty unusual in that census. But there are other places, the University of South Florida has a very active uh, alumni group. And so building alumni groups to come in and help and actually respecting the kinds of things that they suggest is really important. Uh, the other thing, uh, I, 
just personally, I would say, even regardless of your stage, actually developing an independent, um, what is it? Sorry, <laughs> uh, in, in individual development plan uh, is really helpful. And if you go to the, um, the site there for um, uh, AAAS Science Careers, uh, I've had people who, you know, are well into their careers, you know, in their 50s that uh, having looked at this, it said they've gone in and they've taken it and it really helps. Um, and so something I would recommend. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, it's 10 o'clock, but Peter Henning says really has a last question. So Peter, do you want, do you mind on you yourself and just ask? Oh, Lucy, thank you. No, I didn't have a question. It was just uh, appreciated the TextNet scissor shout out and the concept of stakeholder management, both personally and um, organizationally is, uh, you know, part of the soft skills that Sharon and the group have been discussing. So I just had some comments there about how to identify who is a stakeholder, how to manage them, when to build that stakeholder group and when to phase it out when it is time for that. You know, that's just something that comes with experience, but situational awareness is vital. And so it just falls right in with the, the rest of these discussions. Thank you so much, Sharon. Okay. Well, thank you. And it's really nice to see all of you again. So maybe sometime we'll see each other in person. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sharon. Okay, right. it's 10.01, so we, we should finish the, the seminar. Right. And hope to see you all guys. Right. Bye. Thank you very much again. Bye. Bye.